the title of my talk pretty much summarizes what I will be talking, what I will be saying today. I'm going to tell you the story of how we got to the end of the beginning of hepatitis C and speculate on whether we may be at the beginning of the end. Unfortunately, this is a time of COVID and we're in this enormous isolation period and I cannot be in Mexico at this time. In 1992, Dr. Kosenovich invited me to a meeting of the uh, GI Association that was held in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, it was one of the best meetings I've been to, uh, both from scientific standpoint and from a social standpoint. It allowed me to meet uh, David and his wife, and we've been friends for the past 30 years. So um, I'm so sorry I am not now in Mexico. After I received the Nobel Prize, I got this card from Paul Pokros and his wife, which I thought was very profound. And it said, there is no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. I think if there's any lesson from my lecture today, this, this is the one. Uh, it's a long climb in the academic world. And, uh, and sometimes you have success, sometimes you don't. But this is what I'm going to tell you today are the steps that I took along this pathway. The history of hepatitis actually began back in about 400 BC with Hippocrates. Hippocrates was a philosopher, but also a great uh, observer. He was a physician and he observed patients who had yelling of the skin that he termed icterus and hardening of the liver that he termed kiros. And he was most notable. He, he felt that these were due to perturbations of the four humors, yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm. In this case, an excess of yellow bile. Now, while this hypothesis did not stand up to peer review, hypothesis made, I mean, Hippocrates made the uh, key observation that these diseases were not divine punishment, as was believed at that time, but rather they were some upset of the body's four humors. Uh, and it was this breaking away disease from divinity that was so important. Now, nothing much happened over the next 2,000 years, except there were recurrent wars. Uh, and in every war, the combatants came down with jaundice and, and symptoms of uh, viral hepatitis. Uh, it was ultimately called campaign jaundice and then vaccine-induced jaundice, and ultimately distinguished epidemiologically into infectious hepatitis A and serum hepatitis B. But nothing else happened, no observation of a virus, no specific test for a virus over that 2000 year period until the early 1960s, when here at NIH, I was working with Baruch Bloomberg. We were looking for uh, polymorphisms in human serum proteins, uh, which typically were lipoprotein polymorphisms that stain blue in agar. And one day we found this line that stained red, uh, did not take up the lipid stain. Uh, coincidentally, it was due to a reaction between a multiply transfused patient with hemophilia and an Australian Aborigine who just by chance was being tested on that day. For a brief time, this was called the red antigen, but ultimately uh, became known as the hepatitis B surface antigen and led to many hepatitis B related events. The story I'm gonna to tell today though is not about hepatitis B, but about the transfusion studies we established in the late 1960s. Uh, these were, this was a prospective study among open heart surgery patients who were selected because they received a lot of blood, an average of 17 units each on the heart lung machine. 
Importantly, we collected samples pre-transfusion and then every one to two weeks post-transfusion for 12 weeks and then every month for an additional three months. We also saved the donor samples wherever possible. These samples were stored away uh, in frozen, uh, frozen storage, uh, which proved to be incredibly important because we went back into these frozen samples multiple times as new technologies evolved. But initially, the only way we could identify hepatitis was by elevations of the ALT, uh, the serum transaminase, and then early on by hepatitis B testing after 1970. The first thing we found in this prospective study was the inordinately high rate of hepatitis prior to 1970, when patients were receiving about 17 units of blood. And when our blood was coming from uh, paid donor sources, uh, this study by John Walsh showed that if you received at least one unit of paid donor blood, there was a 51% chance of getting hepatitis, whereas if you received only volunteer donor blood, the risk was only 7%. Therefore, in 1970, uh, with this information in hand, we adopted an all-volunteer donor system, and we introduced the first-generation test for hepatitis B surface antigen and then the second generation test. These combined measures led to a precipitous fall in hepatitis incidence from over 30% down to around 10%, even though the number of units transfused remained the same. So it was the source of blood that was the most important. Uh, and nothing in fact we've done since that time has been so important because uh, our incidence was never this high again but this had a profound effect. In 1973, Abbott Laboratories developed a third generation assay for hepatitis B. We went back into these stored samples <clears throat> and somewhat surprisingly found that only about a quarter of the cases were due to hepatitis B virus and that there was some other non-B entity uh, that was uh, causing most of the cases. In 1975, Feinstone and Kapikian and Purcell, shown from your right to your left, uh, were using uh, immune electron microscopy and discovered the hepatitis A virus. Since these individuals were on the NIH campus and close collaborators, uh, we sent our non-B samples to Steve Feinstone and not one of the samples not one of the cases was due to hepatitis A virus. It was therefore in a step of brilliant deductive reasoning that we said if these cases were not A and were not B, we'd call this new form of hepatitis non-A, non-B. I apologize for that awkward nomenclature, but we didn't call it hepatitis C because we hadn't yet proven that it was a viral entity. And if so, we didn't know how many viruses might be involved. So the next step on this pathway was the chimpanzee model. Now chimps uh, developed uh, asymptomatic hepatitis. Uh, uh, they, uh, they were not harmed in these studies. In fact, they love to be in the studies. You can see them here lining up to sign their informed consents. What we found was that we could transmit non-A, non-B hepatitis from patients who had acute or chronic non-A, non-B, as well as from asymptomatic blood donors who had been implicated in hepatitis transmission. The next step on this arduous path, although I, I just want to take a break to say that as a, as a government worker, we are, we are always considered to be lazy and to be living on the government dole. Uh, but I just want you to know that I always have given 100% at work. Uh, it's just that it's had this peculiar distribution. Uh, today is Tuesday, so it's one, one of my, my better days. The next step was another fortuitous event. Uh, this patient now known around the world as Mr. H uh, 
uh, was an inveterate trailblazer. He liked to climb mountains and to, and to blaze trails. Uh, and one day while on a trek, uh, he had a cardiac arrest. Uh, and would have died on the mountain had his wife not been there and administered CPR. She saved his life and ultimately he made his way uh, to NIH where he was found to have triple vessel coronary disease, uh, had a triple bypass surgery, one of the very early ones. This was back in 1977. And shown here in the left of the slide is his clinical course where the ALT levels are shown here in blue. You see the point zero, we had normal ALT, it rose up starting week five and then rose precipitously to 2,112, at which time he was jaundiced and quite, quite sick. Uh, but then the enzymes recovered very rapidly and he went into an asymptomatic state. Uh, and we followed him over the next 30 years. Importantly, at point A uh, on this curve, we, we obtained an apheresis unit, inoculated that into a chimpanzee in the upper right panel, and it was shown to be infectious. And the chimp and then Bob Purcell titered this in other chimps and found that Mr. H had an infectivity titer of one times 10 to 6.5 chimp infectious doses. Interestingly, at point B, we obtained another unit at the peak of his ALT and put that into a second chimp uh, in the middle uh, panel here, and that did not cause hepatitis. We think it didn't cause hepatitis because he was just starting to recover. If you look here at the yellow line, which is HCV RNA levels, you see that shortly after transfusion, there was a little blip in HCV RNA. This was the donor virus coming into the recipient, but then that was contained. But a week four, uh, a new variant emerged uh, and that, that caused a rise in HCV RNA to three times 10 to seven copies per ml, almost identical to the chimp infectivity titer. And then the RNA went down quite rapidly. Uh, so the point B, the RNA was on this rapid fall and also antibody had developed. So the virus was immune complex as shown here. We won't go into that, but that made it less infectious. So I think that's why this did not transmit a point B. But we now had a titered infectious inoculum and we had the chimp model and that allowed subsequent uh, determinations to be made. In this study that Steve Feinstone headed, he took the H inoculum, treated it with chloroform, a lipid solvent, and took away infectivity. Whereas a sham extraction was still infectious in the chimp as shown in the upper panel. So we now knew the virus had a lipid envelope, which could be destroyed by chloroform. In second studies uh, with, uh, done in Dr. Bob Purcell's lab, filtration studies where the, in, where the H material was put through various size filters, and then the filtrates were tested for infectivity in the chimp. We could see that the non-A, non-B agent passed through a 50 nanometer filter, but was stopped by a 30 nanometer filter. Putting these two together, we could discern that the virus must be small, somewhere between 30 and 60 nanometers and be lipid enveloped. This narrowed the potential uh, agents down to either being one of the small RNA viruses, the alpha flaviviruses, being a hepatitis B related virus, but we had a lot of information that it was not related to hepatitis B. So it was either gonna be a new class of viral agents or one of these small RNA viruses uh, as it turned out to be a flavivirus. Now we tried very hard to get a specific test for non-A, non-B, but we're unable to do so over many years of intensive effort. So we switched to studying the virus, uh, studying the disease in patients. 
And with the help of the NIH uh, liver service, we initially biopsied 39 patients and showed that most of them had mild to moderate uh, chronic hepatitis C, but the 10% already had cirrhosis when first biopsied and 13% had what was called severe chronic active hepatitis that was likely to progress to cirrhosis. We then did follow-up biopsies in 20 of these patients. Most were stable. Some even seemed to improve over time, but 25% progressed to cirrhosis under our observation. So we wound up with eight out of 39 or 20% who developed cirrhosis, a figure that has held up over the decades maybe 30, 20 to 30% of non A, non B patients uh, develop cirrhosis. But importantly, three of these patients died of liver failure and another three had severe liver disease when they died of their underlying heart disease. So we now knew that non A, non B was not just a benign transaminitis as some people thought, but it was a disease that could progress to cirrhosis and liver-related death. Now, while the clinical severity was becoming increasingly evident, we just could not come up with a serologic, enzymatic, or immunologic, or even an early molecular method for a specific non-A, non-B assay. And it was at that time that I wrote this poem of frustration called, I Can't See the Forest for the HBAGs. It went, I think that I shall never see this virus called non-A, non-B, a virus uh, I cannot deliver, and yet I know it's in the liver. A virus that we often blame, but which exists alone by name. No antigen or DNA, no little test to mark its way. A virus which in our confusion has mass, forces into mass collusion to make exist just by exclusion, but is it real or an illusion? Oh, great liver in the sky, show us where and tell us why. Send us thoughts that will inspire us. Let us see this elusive virus. If we don't publish soon, they're going to fire us. Well, this poem, silly as it was, it was presented at a national meeting, and I think it greatly influenced Michael Houghton and the Chiron Corporation, because very shortly thereafter, uh, they cloned the non-A, non-B agent. They did this by pelleting high tide of plasma from chimpanzee that Dan Bradley had given them, or from uh, human cases. They extracted the RNA, reverse transcribed that into cDNA, cut that up with restriction enzymes, and importantly used the Farge GT uh, expression vector, which had just been discovered. This GT11 vector would allow not only for the genome to be transferred, but also would express any protein coded for by that genome. They put this Farge into infect E. coli, allowed it to grow in agar, then lice the, lice the growth onto filter paper. And then in a third important step, assume that there would be antibody in patients who had convalesced from non-A, non-B hepatitis or who had chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis, even though antibody had never been demonstrated to that point. The story goes that they screened six million clones before they found a single clone that reacted with this antibody. But then they could take that single clone, uh, re-express it, express the proteins from it, eventually uh, walk the genome and develop a small protein fragment, which was the basis for the first antibody assay to hepatitis C. This was a tour de force because this was in the early days of molecular biology. Here's a picture of Michael Houghton on the right at the time he received the Alaska Award, uh, which I was lucky to share. And a picture of Dan Bradley from the CDC who worked with Chiron and was instrumental in these studies.
The first thing that Chiron did after they believed they had an antibody assay for non-A, non-B or hepatitis C was to request the panel I had developed, the non-A, non-B panel, which was a small panel, but it had confused 19 other laboratories who had claimed a non-A, non-B assay. No one had broken this code properly, but Chiron did. Now in this small panel, Every sample had been proven infectious in a chimpanzee, and every negative control came from a donor who had donated at least 10 times and never been involved in hepatitis transmission. Chiron detected all three chronic carriers in six different samples in six different locations randomly placed on the plate. Uh, they also detected two implicated donors in four different random positions. They did not detect uh, two patients with acute non-A, non-B because they were looking for antibody and not for virus. But later these two patients seroconverted for antibody. And importantly, they did not find the uh, test to be positive in seven negative controls in 14 different random positions in the panel. So they got 100%. We then looked at 15 of our best non-A, non-B post-transfusion cases and found that in 100%, the patients were negative for this antibody pre-transfusion and then became positive uh, post-transfusion, having seroconverted. We then looked at the blood donors to 25 such cases, found a positive donor in 80% by a first generation assay and 88% by a second generation assay. Therefore, we could predict that if we introduce this test into blood donor screening, we might prevent near 90% of post-transfusion hepatitis. Indeed, that's what happened. This is the whole perspective study from pre-1970 through 1997. We talked about this early phase at the beginning of the lecture. We then did different interventions, lowered the amount of blood transfused, added anti-hepatitis B core testing. Uh, and finally, by 1990, the rates had come down to about 4.1%. The first generation test for hepatitis C was introduced in 1990. This dropped the rates down to 1.1% with only one case of hepatitis C. And then by 1990, second generation test came in 1992. And by 1997, we reached zero incidence in this prospective study. Doesn't mean the rate is really zero, but one can now mathematically calculate that the risk of transfusion transmitted hepatitis is about one in 2 million. So we come from one in three in 1970 to one in two million by 1997. It can be estimated from these incident figures extrapolated to the US population as a whole that perhaps 4.8 million HCV infections were transfusion transmitted between 1970 and 1990. And conversely, that HCV testing introduced in 1990 may have prevented 2.4 million additional transmissions in the two decades from 1990 to 2010. Now, this is the same slide, except for this downward arrow. And I show this because this is not only the story of post-transfusion hepatitis, this is the story of, of my life. And you can see that both transfusion hepatitis in my life are on this very severe, sharp decline. And I'm just happy uh, that hepatitis seems to reach bottom and I'm, I'm still here uh, talking about it. So that is the end of the beginning. Uh, the eradication of post-transfusion hepatitis, the development of good assays for hepatitis C, uh, and that led into ancillary studies. Uh, I want to go into a few of these. As you know, there are 
uh, about 70 million people chronically infected with hepatitis C, five million of those in the US. I'm not sure how many in Mexico, but probably close to that number. <laughs> and the peculiar part of hepatitis C is that 75 to 85 percent of patients go on to develop persistent infection. So we were interested in why this might be, be the case. Uh, so working with Patricia Farsi here at NIH, Patricia took the H inoculum, uh, the strain H from 1977, and produced 105 clones from that single sample. And you see that 57% of those clones were identical, but at the same time, there were 19 other clones uh, present in that single sample. This is the quasi-species nature of HCV where multiple variants exist at one time. So even if there was a good immune response to the dominant clone, any one of these others could have then assumed dominance. To further look at this, Patricia uh, took uh, 10 clones from this patient uh, during the... Uh, from the time of transfusion to the peak of the ALT shown again in blue. Uh, and at each point performed, uh, studied or sequenced 10 clones. You can see that at week three, there were sort of three co-dominant clones, arbitrary labeled A, B, and C. But by week eight, D was now the dominant clone and it was also E, F, and G. By week 13, after antibody had appeared, antibody driving more uh, variation in the virus, you can see that, uh, that clone A was still there, but now there was also H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and by week 16, all the way up to U. So this continuing evolution of the viral quasi-species is what makes it so hard to develop a uh, vaccine against hepatitis C. And it's what keeps the uh, virus persistent despite neutralizing antibody responses. There's also a defect in the uh, T cell responses shown here in the study by Wertheimer. This is not from our group, but you can see the patients who have chronic uh, hepatitis C have very poor to no CD4 or CD8 responses by LE spot assay. They're almost no different from normal controls who were never exposed to hepatitis C. However, when these patients recover, their CD4 responses uh, are excellent and as are their CD8 responses. This means that the viral infection blunts CD4 and CD8 uh, efficacy, it doesn't kill the cells because uh, they come back after recovery, but it blunts their effect effectiveness. So these are the two main reasons for chronic infection. Now, looking at our cases over time, there were three general patterns. Most of the patients really had very stable or slowly progressive disease for the 30 or 40 years that we followed some of them. Uh, but 20 to 30% had severe progressive disease where they developed cirrhosis in 15 to 40 years. And less than 5% had a rapidly progressive course where they could develop cirrhosis in five to 10 years. So we're interested in seeing why some people had this milder form and others this more progressive form. I think these rapidly progressive cases had coexistent NASH uh, and or alcoholic hepatitis. But just this group versus this group, uh, again, a study with Patricia Farsi, where we studied a slow progressor uh, versus a rapid progressor. You see the slow progressors, uh, this was Mr. H again, had a rapid rise in the HCV RNA, but then it was contained, almost went, disappeared, but did not quite disappear, and then rose again, and then became persistent. Uh, this is the slow progressive course. 
uh, whereas the rapid progressors shown in blue uh, never were able to control uh, the viral load and it just hovered around and went into chronicity. We found that slow progressors uh, had sort of good cytokine, resp cytokine responses. They had higher levels of interferon gamma, MIP1 beta, uh, and these were helpful elements in keeping inflammation down. Whereas rapid progressors had a high level of MCP1, monocyte chemotactic, chemotactic protein. This is a pro-fibrogenic chemokine that attracts stellate cells and is also produced by uh, hepatic stellate cells, setting up the, this loop of continuous uh, fibrogenic stimulation uh, leading to the uh, progression to cirrhosis. I want to talk, uh, I'll show you just one study that I, I find fascinating. This is a study we, done, we did with investigators in Japan, uh, Yasuhiro Tanaka and Dr. Mizokami in Nagoya, Japan. Um, and where we compared Japanese genotype 1B with US genotype 1A using a molecular CARC. This is a mathematical modeling uh, where you can take sequential samples from a given patient and extrapolate back uh, to the time this particular genotype diverged from some common ancestor and then when it spread rapidly within a population. Uh, and you can see that in Japan in red, uh, genotype 1B diverged around 19, 1880, was then stable until the 1930s and 1940s and then tapered off again. But what was happening in Japan in 1930s and 1940s where they were at war, first with China and then with the allies, uh, we learn now in retrospect that the Japanese soldiers were shooting up with amphetamines prior to battle, uh, that they were sharing needles, and this was the probable cause of the high rates of hepatitis C in Japan, which are now tapering off because they're no longer sharing needles in that population. In contrast, in the U.S., Genotype 1A appeared around 1910, then was stable until the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, when it rose precipitously due to our own needle sharing epidemic for illicit drug use. Uh, the important point of this slide is that there's a 30 to 40 year spread between the Japanese occurrence and the US occurrence. And this is important because the Japanese incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma is eight to 10 times greater uh, than the incidence in the US. And the Japanese have always predicted that when, when the US has the virus, as long as they've had it in Japan, that our rates will also uh, equal their rates, our rates of carcinoma. Indeed, this is probably the case. In this study by El Sarag and Baylor, you can see that between the late uh, 1970s and the late 1990s, the rate of hepatocellular carcinoma has increased threefold in the US. And it's all due to hepatitis C, not to B and not to other causes. It was predicted in 2009 that if there were no changes in the standard of care, that the total number of patients with advanced liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma by 2029 would be fourfold higher than they were in 2009. Fortunately, there has been a dramatic change in the standard of care. As you know, we now have, oops, excuse me, we now have these uh, great uh, drugs that have come along in 2011, the direct acting antivirals that the cure rates now in hepatitis C are 95 to 100%. Uh, it's been uh, just a, a miracle that I didn't expect to happen in my lifetime, but it has. So now that we have these great cure rates and we have a uh, very sensitive test, one can say, well, we could look at hepatitis C as the glass half full, 
or the glass half empty. If you see the glass is half full, you can say with cure rates which approach 100%, from this time forward, once HCV infection is identified, no one should develop cirrhosis to the hepatitis C or develop any other hepatitis C sequelae. But if you see the glass is half full, you realize that we've only identified perhaps 50% of HCV infections, that many, many people are still carrying this virus and don't know it. This rate is probably much higher in the developing world. Uh, so enhanced population screening is priority one if we're going to really eradicate this disease. The second point is even the known carriers, uh, initially only a minority got these drugs uh, because the cost was so high. Uh, this proportion has uh, thankfully improved greatly, but still there are known carriers who have not yet been treated. So the cost of drugs has been a, a main impediment to treatment, prevented the cure of millions throughout the world. So cure is no longer constrained by science. It's really a matter of dollars. So if we want to eradicate or eliminate hepatitis C and B, uh, these are the pathways. For hepatitis B, we have a great vaccine. Uh, it's at least 95% efficacious. You also have nucleotide and nucleoside inhibitors that can lower the viral loads to undetectable and, and reduce transmission. Uh, with hepatitis C, we don't have a, a, a vaccine as yet. It's been very difficult to develop, uh, but we do have these great drugs. So to eradicate for global eradication, uh, we just need a little miracle. Uh, but there are parameters to this miracle. First of all, for C, we, for B, we have the universal vaccination. They say, and, and this is the birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine is being given throughout the world. There's more to be done, but there's really been massive progress. For C, we need to detect almost all these HCV carriers through massive global screening. And we need to do that with rapid assays, which can be used uh, in the field as well as in, in uh, medical practices. And then we need to deliver these DAAs with at least 90% penetration each population. Uh, what I envision is with this rapid test, you would not only test somebody either in the field or in the office or any medical facility, but you would immediately have the drugs available to give the patient the first month or two months of treatment so that you don't lose the patient before you get the drugs in. So this is not easy, but it's already been shown uh, in, in Egypt that it can be done. They've treated almost the entire country. Brazil is attempting to do this as well as are other countries. Uh, so we don't need better tests. We don't need better treatments. We just need the political, the corporate, the philanthropic, and the moral will to make it happen. I think it will. Uh, it's going to take, take some time. It's not going to happen on my watch because I have a new philosophic perspective of life versus age, where I have age on the abscissa and give a damn on the ordinate. And this is me out here. I've reached the end of this line. So it's you young people in the audience who are going to take on this challenge to eradicate hepatitis C. Uh, I, I, I really think you can do it. So I just want to end with a, a poem I wrote after I received the Nobel Prize. Um, it's called, I Never Had No Nobel Dreams. When I grew up in Ridgewood, Queens, I never had no Nobel dreams. My goal was to hit the ball between the seams, to perhaps be a hero on one of my teams, to not have mom detect my schemes. High school was unauspicious. I mixed with the mob, did nothing suspicious. I was small for my age and basically shy could have been the model for catcher in the rye. I was not voted most likely to succeed. 
but there was already a hint my hair would recede. When I graduated high school, I gave no speeches. There was no sign that one day my deeds would exceed those of my teachers. Nothing about me was the fodder for memes, and certainly I never had no Nobel dreams. In my 20s, it was medical school, reading textbooks by the reams, studying cadavers splayed at the seams. From massive texts, I was sucking the nectars, studying all night and sleeping through lectures. At Rochester Med, great teachers abounded. Everything was interesting. My career choices compounded, but of Nobel thoughts, I had noughts. Then came marriage and baby screams, my first house secure in its beams. I was ready to take on whatever life deems. Children growing, my career flowing, lots of patience, lots of teaching. Deep research though, seemed beyond my reaching. Nobel aspirations, no one was preaching. Then an aboriginal, Aboriginal antigen I had observed in my youth was linked to hepatitis B by Blumberg, the sleuth. Of hepatitis viruses, we were discerning the truth. For me, a chance to return to my NIH roots. Non A, non B arose from prospective studies. I tracked this agent along with bright NIH buddies. And with Chiron's cloning of C, there came the safest of bloodies. With this, my career advanced, but Nobel dreams I never chanced. And now my non-Nobel dream has unfolded. With new credentials, I'm suddenly emboldened. A thousand congratulatory emails, my computer uploaded. But from Nobel aspirations, I was not truly molded. I expect any day Karolinska will have annulled it. And I will be the first laureate to have his medal ungolded, to have the King of Sweden say, from altar, we best hold it. Get the medal back before he has sold it. This award has given my life a massive shakeup. My heart and my mind are having a breakup. Strange forces are scrambling my genetic makeup. Though the leaves of my life, age will soon rake up. I'm happy to be, be, be where I am because in life, there's no makeup. From this Nobel dream, I'm afraid to wake up. Thank you very much.